Hi, I'm Sherry Fletcher, and this is part one of the emotional journey of motherhood with guest Jennifer Bryan of Practical Family. Today, Jen and I will be discussing the vital roles that moms play in helping kids to navigate their emotions, how they need to depend on God to use their feelings as a gauge and not a guide, and how we as moms can also apply the same lessons. I know that you'll be blessed by the information that Jen shares. And you can find Jen at practicalfamily.org and all the links to her um, websites and Facebook pages are in the notes. So I hope you enjoy today's guest with Jennifer Bryant. Good afternoon. I see it's afternoon for Jennifer and it's evening for me. So I'm five o'clock here in Seattle. So you are two o'clock? Yeah, it's about two o'clock. Two o'clock. We won't tell you where she is right now because we'll just let you guess that for a second. Um, but I'm here with my good friend, Jennifer Bryant. And um, I have to say, Jennifer is the first person that I, that has ever interviewed me. So I was so nervous when she asked if she could interview me and uh, you did you did such a good job of teaching and coaching and helping me and so I was blessed to be interviewed on your website and um, all the links to anything that we're talking about today is in the comments so links to Jennifer's information her Facebook her website and the first interview with me is on there but this is Jennifer Bryant and she's visiting us online from Honolulu Hawaii Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> so we are doing this live um, in quarantine. And so I bet a lot of people are like, oh, I wish I could be quarantined in Hawaii as well. <laughs> but I'm sure it's just the same as being quarantined anywhere else if you can't go anywhere. Are you guys allowed to go to the beaches or? Yeah, they opened up the beaches recently. They they say if you're going to be there, you need to be moving or exercising, and so or you know watching kids in the water. So well, at least they can go. So that's, yeah. the ocean is the best place we can be actually for fighting all those uh, you know possible viral things. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're getting a little bit of sun today here in Seattle, but not not enough to be outside too long. So, so Jen um, is in Honolulu with her two kids and her hubby, and you are lucky enough to have been an educator and um, homeschooling before this happened, and so you had a little bit of a, a step up on some that have to learn homeschooling real quickly. And um, one thing I love about Jen's ministry, many things I love about Jen's ministry, um, Practical Family, is it supports mothers in real life struggles. And you're currently homeschooling, like I mentioned, but you also have resources that encourage moms in their homeschooling. And what I like is that you aren't really a how-to mentor, you're a I'm with you mentor. And mm -hmm. I just, I really like that about you. Um, so we're going to be talking today about emotions. And I think there's a lot of emotions going on right now. But you wrote a piece in Living by Design, and you start off um, on you talk about navigating with emotions, and you start off sharing the story of your the birth of your child. And I think when people read it, they'll all relate, especially that terrifying moment when they place a human being in your arms, and you all of a sudden these all these emotions you never thought could all happen at one time are all there in your arms and you are now responsible for a person. Um, and so you have stated that the moment we are responsible for another human being is the moment that our own emotional journey begins. So start us off with that. Yeah, it's when I, when I held my baby girl for the first time, Chloe is now 11 years old. I, I look at her little face and I remember the doctor handing her to me or the nurse really handing her and she was just this bundle that I was as soon as she was put in my hand I felt all the weight of that responsibility and that was the first time that I was overwhelmed and panicked almost by this 
the situation and it surprised me because I'm, I'm the oldest of four kids. I served in children's ministry from the time I was about 11 years old. So I'm used to being around kids. I didn't expect to be this really nervous first time mother, honestly. But when your own kid is put in your hands and then you're expected to take them home and take care of them, I thought, wait, wait, why are, why are these people letting me take this kid out of this hospital? Like, what, can a nurse come with me? You know, it was, it was overwhelming. And then when I got home, my husband had to leave and go back to the, the restaurant, our family business, right away. And I thought... He left, he left me with this kid. What, what's going to happen? <laughs> what if I drop her? <laughs> you know, and so it was just, it was a whirlwind of, of feelings that I wasn't quite ready for. Um, but it is funny how we doubt ourselves when we're in situations that we've never been in before. You know, it's, it's kind of like, of, of course, you've never done this before. It, it, it's expected that you wouldn't know what in the world to do. But it's okay to not know what to do, <laughs> you know, as long as you know kind of who to ask for it. But, but I really believe that God equips us to what he's called us to. And that includes motherhood. That includes parenting on the, on the larger scale. He doesn't say, like, go get a degree in parenting. And then when you're ready, you know, I'll have somebody sign off on it. And then you can, you can do it, you know. Like, we've set up those traditions for ourselves as, as humans. And, and we've set up stipulations that kind of keep us from, from feeling inadequate, but also it prepares, it largely prepares us for a world who needs, who needs us to, you know, do our part to take care of humanity and things. But, but when it comes to parenting, I think it's, it's good and it's okay to be scared a little bit because if we were overly confident, you know, we might probably make a lot more mistakes. So. Absolutely. I, I heard a, quote once that I liked that said, um, when God wrote your life story, he factored in your mistakes. Yeah. And okay. so when he gave us this kids. He knew, you know, he knew that what he was doing, <laughs> he knew the kind of parent he would be. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I like how you mentioned, we, you know, you've never had such a range of emotions and I know I can go from bliss to panic in seconds as a parent. And I'm an empty nest parent now. And, you know, so you look back and you, think about all the things you wish you could have and should have done. But I have to say that some, I'm sad to look back at some of the times when I was really terrified, but I didn't express that I was terrified. It came out in anger. It came out mm -hmm. in anger. And a lot of times I can go back and self shame for not allowing emotions to be a guide. I really like, um, how you stated it in this article about using them as a guide. And so as a parent, what would you say to model that, um, you know, model using emotions as a guide? Well, you know, it's tough not to blame ourselves for our own feelings, right? Because they, they're coming up from inside of us. We can easily believe that because our feelings are bad or, or they're uncomfortable when we feel them, that we're bad because we're feeling them, you know, and yeah. it's just the opposite that because, uh, just because I feel amazing doesn't make me an amazing person <laughs> necessarily, <laughs> right? It doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, you know, you can have all the self-confidence in the world, but your, your character is tested when it affects other people, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I could be amazing and still be trampling over somebody in a very selfish way right so so the point is our our feelings can't be trusted to to guide us they can't be trusted uh, um i mean yes they, they can't be trusted to guide us um necessarily it's like it's almost like if you were to put the cart like you know that analogy the cart before the horse they don't put the cart before the horse the horse needs to lead the cart right so or it's like if the tail is wagging the dog, right? Our feelings and emotions are natural God-given things. Mm -hmm. And when we feel things as a response to our, what's already happening inside of us, our, our emotional reactions are based on what's important to us, what, what's valuable to us, right? And that's what's going to come out first. Um, some of us are very deep feelers and incredibly empathetic because the human um, experience helps us to see um, you know, people healed and people to come to a, a, a better sense of themselves when they feel these things. And some of us have really strong feelings that drive us to do great things 
and overcome hardship and all of that. But so it's it's important for us to keep moving forward. And those of us who are more on the quiet side, you know, um, and like to sit back and listen because, you know, a peaceful environment is our highest priority. So, so those feelings, when they come to the surface, it's going to reveal what's most important to us individually, Mm -hmm. but we can't attribute good or bad feelings to, to, to being a good or a bad person. They're merely indicators of what's coming up from the inside, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and all of these values are going to come out differently and for different reasons, right? I mean, um, getting angry with our kids is going to come from somewhere inside of us that 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 either feels violated or is is a is maybe in a kind of a backwards way out of love because we don't want to see our kids go down a path that is negative. Right. So we react in anger because we're afraid of the bad thing happening to them or them making bad choices, right? Maybe like we did <laughs> because we, we remember our childhood. Um, but there's no shame in that. We can let our emotions um, that come out be indicators of our internal values and have no shame attached to it. So I was thinking of this example like, did one of your kids ever try to run into the street or close yes. to traffic or something like that? Do you, do you kind of, and so yeah. what, what was that feeling? What, what came up for you right away when that happened? It's panic immediately. It's panic. And then a lot of times, mm-hmm. like I said, I would maybe even get mad. Like, why were yeah. you doing, why'd you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Why would you put yourself in that situation? Right. Don't you know better? You know, yeah. all these things and that, you know, we've all said and thought these things. It's not, you know, again, don't feel shame for, for wanting to protect your kids, but these emotions come out strongly, especially in moms when we feel like there's something threatening our kid. Right. But um, that strong sense of fear turns into protection and then when that threat is gone, it tends to kind of rise to the surface as anger. It's kind of like those residual feelings come up and then all you can see and feel is, oh, why couldn't I control that situation, you know? Um, so we have to get used to being able to recognize what's happening when it happens. Um, I find that the more that I do that for myself as a mom, the less... Um, the less nervous and less anxious I become about things that happen to my kids or things that my kids choose to do or um, my own reaction to them because we can't control everything in this world as much as I would like to. I, I just can't. And it's much better when I have a piece about paying attention to my own emotional reactions. Um, so I try to ask myself, like, who am I angry at, you know? Is, am I angry at my kids for running somewhere or am I angry at myself for letting it happen um, or just for not being able to control it? You know, sometimes we get angry because and we berate ourselves because we should have seen it coming. You know, we, we're the adult. We're supposed to protect our, our child. And, and those those thoughts are very real, but they're they're unnecessarily condemning. And if we con- constantly live in that place, it's going to do no good for us as parents to kind of to stay there. Um, but I found that, you know, that kind of self-reflection and being able to go back and ask yourself those real questions instead of just ignoring it and moving on and asking yourself, um, or ask the Lord, really ask God, pray and ask God, you know, why are these things important to me? Why did I react that way? Instead of saying, oh, Jen, you're so stupid. Why did you do that again? You know? We don't need to do that. We can simply ask the question and then ask God to reveal to us what's going on on the inside. Um, One of the ways that I do this is, um, okay, so I I try to do that for me, but then I also try to talk it out loud with my kids. Okay, this is a real mom slash woman moment right now, but I talk out loud with my kids when I when I can calm myself down and be in this place to be honest and say, mommy doesn't feel good right now. <laughs> mommy has a headache or Mom, <laughs> I had to say out loud to myself, to my husband too, I'm, I'm PMSing right now, okay? Or I'm about to start my period. No, it's not an, an excuse, but it's a real chemical, physical, biological thing that we go through that throws our hormones off, right? So paying attention to things like that when they come up is not, that's not shameful or self-condemning. It's real. And to be able to say out loud, honey, I don't feel good today. Guys, 
I'm sorry, Mom, mommy's head hurts, okay? I mean, I don't, I'm not blaming it on you. I'm just saying my head hurts, so I'm not going to be real, you know, calm right now if you start making a lot of noise. And I'm real sensitive, too, sometimes to noise. Um, so I need to warn them before things like that come out. So if I'm aware of my warning signals, they can be aware of my warning signals and also learn how to sense their own yeah. internal warning signals on top of that. So. Well, you explaining that is more of an, you know, they're learning by example. Instead of you saying, now, next time you're feeling this way, you need to talk it out. When they're seeing you talk it out, when they're seeing you, ex you know, example that, um, it, it, it kind of shows them how to use their emotions as more of a gauge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I love that. Right now, we are living in a society that, you know, I hear this because I work with youth a lot. We live in this society that tells people if it feels right, it is right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the decisions that are being made are being made from an emotion. Mm -hmm. And one of the phrases that um, I don't care for is you do you. Do you. <laughs> that one drives me nuts. That can be dangerous because to me that gives um, whatever emotion you're having at the moment, it gives it the freedom to dictate the behavior. So it, it, the you do you gives the tail the freedom to wag the dog. Yeah. And I love the statement that you used, um, you know, earlier, depending on God to use the feelings as a gauge instead of a guide. Um, it just, and you modeling that by telling them, this is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm going to come across. Um, I think that helps a lot but what would you say about you know this you do you if it feels right it is right mentality that our kids are being taught and being shown and it's kind of in their world and in tv and commercials and magazines social media mm -hmm. what, what yeah. would you say about that concept well t you know the the concept of, of you do you i think when people use it in different contexts um we need to kind of understand it in the context that that it's being used but also if if we find ourselves thinking to say it um it's like you know do what's right for you is not is not wrong in and of itself it just it it, it really depends on the context that it's coming from but when it's like don't tell me what to do i'm going to do what i want it, even at the expense of other people, right. it can, can have a really base and selfish and immature um, uh, consequence to it and not recognizing that our actions do have the, uh, a profound effect on other people. Even our feelings, you know, you know, they say that, you know, if mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> it's like, sh <laughs> sure, but if mom is constantly throwing the stones of her emotions around everywhere and affecting and manipulating her, her husband or her kids to to bow to her her feelings and her whims that's not cool i mean have we, we we've seen um pride and prejudice right you remember the mama from pride and prejudice i'm here uh -oh. yeah i don't know where. oh there you are okay <laughs> i thought i lost you um you know you, if you've seen the movie pride and prejudice and you remember the mom from pride and prejudice she was one who <laughs> threw her feelings at everyone and blamed everyone else for her her grievances and her spasms and anxieties and things. <laughs> it's like, come on, lady. That's yes. not, nobody, nobody respected her. Nobody right. at all, right? Because she did not take responsibility for her own emotions. She let her emotions drive her, drive everything that she did. Um, when we don't regularly practice checking in with ourselves, we can let our feelings take us wherever the wind blows. Um, and then it becomes easy and almost routine to depend on our feelings, what we're feeling. And then that's when we, we, we follow our feelings everywhere. You know, it can become easy if we, if we practice doing that instead of practicing the self-control that we can have as a mature grown-up human being, you know, um, instead of that, instead of giving into those impulses, um, that is, can become really in, irresponsible and immature, um, all that self gratification is going to teach us that we have the right to feel those feelings whenever the heck we feel like feeling them. And then everybody else just has to deal with it. And you know what that's called? Entitlement. <laughs> Entitlement means that everyone else has to um, 
basically look out for you because what you need is priority above mm-hmm. others. And it's, it's selfish at its core. Um, and entitlement comes when, when there is too much freedom and lack of accountability. Mm-hmm. And I, I, sometimes I'm afraid of saying it this plainly and clearly, but I think we live in a world who kind of, who needs to hear it and needs to see both beside each other because this does not only apply to you know young kids or teens growing up this applies to adults who need to learn to adult better and get a better handle on their emotions myself included i mean i will blame anything on my husband if i want to get out of saying i'm sorry or something like that it's and it's not a good place to be because it doesn't promote unity it doesn't promote you know um humility and it doesn't bring us to a place where we can actually learn and grow if we're not willing to actually meet our feelings where they are um living right now in this age of pandemic our decisions right now have to be more about we than about me you know what i'm saying like we have to look out for others and we need we need to wear our masks in public right now or at least until the order is lifted you know it's it's for the protection of others and and we can read between the lines on that and make our own personal decisions of course but overall we need to be looking out for the well-being of of each other and other people so um the point is is that really our action always affect others our actions always affect others and to have self-awareness plus understanding your own actions will lead you to think of others first and instead of constantly about me and what I need you know um knowing what you need is not a bad thing and and this and this is where I encourage moms to um to look at at, to look at their own needs and, and ask for what they need but when we uh, when it's time to be others minded we have to think about and be aware of our own emotions and how it's affecting others. Um, to have social awareness plus that objective accountability and honesty with ourselves, I think equals wisdom. Yeah. You know, as I was thinking about this, in in I, I think in formulas and I think in in graphic organizers sometimes because I'm such a teacher, so I'm just like, well, okay, social awareness, objective accountability, honesty wisdom bam (laughs) you know it works it works but you know if that's what you need to kind of think about the elements that go into putting this all together for yourself um you know we can i think number one be more aware and then better be better teachers to our kids about how to be aware aware of their feelings um so yeah go ahead um, no, I just like how you um, said one thing that's really good in teaching our kids to pay attention to their feelings um, is asking them a couple questions. And, you know, we could even apply that to ourselves. I mean, we say ask, you have a couple questions to ask the kids, but we could even, when we're going to have a moment when we feel our emotions are starting to take over, to ask these questions of ourselves is good as well um so yeah tell us about the questions that you like to ask two questions what are you feeling (laughs) label it it's so important to label it once they can express it this is what i'm feeling because like for me if i could have if instead of just jumping into anger when i got mad i could just say you know this i'm really scared right now yeah yeah and you know that not everybody knows how to identify their feelings um, I, I was actually, I forgot to print it out here, but I was going to, um, post about it later on my so- own social media The every therapist that I've been to for myself or for others has had this wheel of sorts. And you may have even seen it. It's, it's, it's a wheel that has the basic feelings in there. Like sad. Are you sad? Are you happy? Are you mad? Are you, you know, basic. And then the wheel opens up to different variations of sad. Like I'm really depressed I'm that like bigger adjectives for these <laughs> for these feelings and it's important to see the wheel not just on a basic level so for kids they can maybe point to little emoji faces and and identify oh are you feeling more that more this or more this or more mm-hmm. 
this or more, you know, like, and, and yeah. help them to interpret how to feel that. Actually, I'm taking the, my own kids. I'll show you later, Sherry, but I want to mention it here. I'm taking my own kids through a social skills curriculum right now. And it's a fun interactive workbook. And it, and it helps them to first start by recognizing the emotions of other people, like when they walk into a room. So it describes a scenario of a, a girl crying on a soccer field and the other kids are playing, but she's on the sidelines crying. And it asks them, what do you see? What do you hear? If you were to walk up to this situation, what do you hear and what do you feel? What does it make mm -hmm. you feel in here? And it's and so they got to name very slowly. Oh, it looks like she's crying. Maybe she needs this. It looks like she wasn't invited to play, or it looks like she hurt herself. So just being aware of the feelings of others helps them to be able to identify. Oh, I'm sad. I'm frustrated. The other day, my <laughs> Chloe told me that what her brother said offended her, and I'm like, Ooh, that's a good word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what offended you because he kept interrupting her he kept not letting her talk it's like okay let's go with that this is how you say i was hurt because you didn't let me talk and da, 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 da. so so being able to identify what that feeling is is so important because i've seen adults bring this lack of vocabulary really into their adulthood and then they just shut down they just they just they, they don't engage in confrontation because they don't know how to talk about their feelings and that yes. is so common again it's nothing to be ashamed of it's just but you do need to be aware of it if you're an adult who was never really trained in how to identify and name your feelings and then maybe you were felt bad for even having them for yeah. even for even being, you know, a feeling person or being hurt, maybe in your in your circle or your family, it meant weakness. It meant like, oh, you can't, yeah. you can't make a joke or you can't. Oh, we're being sarcastic or whatever. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. You know, it's not that big a deal. It is a big deal if it affects you on the inside and you're the only one who can feel it. It has to be made known. Okay. Um, now again, I'm not a therapist, okay, but I've worked enough in this area and with kids and with families to be able to identify the things that keep people from actually having the clarity of mind when it comes to their own emotions. Instead of labeling them as bad or themselves as bad, they need to label the feeling that they're having in the moment. So that's the number one thing. What are you feeling? And number two, what happened right before you started feeling this? So they need to identify the event that happened right before that so that they can make that connection mm -hmm. in, a, in a clearer way so that they can build really what I call um, um, a precedent of memories connected to that feeling. Because if I feel like a ping of offense every time, like let's say every time... Um, I tell my husband something, but he doesn't look at me when I tell him. But in my mind, I think that he's being disrespectful, but he's not. that's not his intention at all. That's not his heart at all. Or if I do something similar to him, or if I don't laugh at a joke or something, like, <laughs> that I don't think he's funny or I'm not listening to him. But we have to talk about that. Like, I'm, I feel this when you da-da-da-da-da. Or, oh, I feel this when this person is around. Maybe it's because she said something weird to me last time and I didn't take the time to clear it up or something, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it can be very little, but it's noticing what happened right before you felt that feeling. And teaching our kids at this young age, imagine, I mean, when they're adults, being the line of communication that they'll be able to have and the the freedom of being able to express it without being anger or it coming out in another aspect, you know, um, mm -hmm. there's so much and that we don't have the time or the, to go into how much behind, you know, what we turn to for soothing is mm -hmm. coming from a lack of being able to really under, under, understand the source of the, you know, the deeper meaning for what we're turning to. Right, um, right. So I found that psychology wheel, I found the emotion wheel, and I popped mm. up the comments. Um, I didn't look at it too exclusively. It's a PDF, so, well, maybe it's not the right one. But um, real quick, you, you shared your story and I, I about cornhole, about your son's cornhole, that I thought was, that's <laughs> a bit, yeah, if you want to share that one. I liked that one. Yeah, um, this happened last week. <laughs> This is very recent. Um, 
we were playing cornhole, that game where you have the boards, you have to get the beanbag into the hole or close to the hole or something like that. It's a very simple, fun game. And um, it, it wasn't just about this game because this happens at other times too, but my poor son, <laughs> he's 10 years old, he broke down over just not being able to do it, not being able to get the beanbag in the hole or close to it. And so it, what I noticed about him is that when he feels incompetent, it just brings almost the whole of his person down. And my first instinct is to say, it's not that big a deal. It's just a game. Come on, like, have fun, you know. But it's not as simple as that for him. It takes him a little bit longer to be pulled out of that place. And I have to watch my reaction because my reaction is... First, almost a fear that he's gonna um, that he's gonna become entitled or lazy or not a hard worker because he's like giving up too soon, right? So that reaction in me as a mom can be dangerous if I unleash those kinds of accusations or words on him, which I have before. Okay, I'm not saying I haven't done it before. <laughs> I only recognize it now because I have done it before and it's not turned out good. It's just like I can see it wearing on my kids when I when I accuse them of something because I'm afraid that they're going to turn into this awful entitled person. And my husband and I work very hard at trying to instill responsibility in them, but I can't be mad at him for his mad feelings. You know what I mean? Like until he learns to recognize those feelings for himself, his his feelings need to serve as a gauge for me mm. to understand how to guide him. Because I'm his guide right now. I need to help him to understand how to gauge his own emotions to guide himself later and then increasingly, you know, point him to God. So he's having a hard time with this with this game. And he's getting visibly angry and frustrated with himself. Like, so, like he's he's tensing up. He's getting just I can't do it. He's saying, he's saying I'll never do it right. I I can't learn this. This is too hard, or you know things like that. Yeah. And then he like kind of half does it, like you know, I just, <laughs> and that gets me more frustrated because he's not trying. But it's because all everything happening in his little mind is keeping him from seeing the the positive potential outcome and he doesn't have a history of seeing potential outcomes yet because he's not a grown-up you know i i can see that but i can't berate him for what he can't see you know so the truth that i need to remind myself when he gets like this is number one when he's visibly angry the truth that i need to speak into his life is i know it's hard it's hard or it feels hard is the empathy we need to bring first because nobody's going to listen to you if you don't first empathize with them. Number two, he says, I can't do it. And I say, I know because you've never done it before. <laughs> it's okay. And I, I, sorry, I'm sorry. I laugh every time I say that because oh, yeah. it, it sounds funny inside of my head, but I know you. it's because you haven't done it and it's okay. You don't need to get down on yourself because you haven't done it before. Um, when he says, I'll never do it right, or he does this self-loathing thing. The truth is, I can say you can, you can do it right. You just have to make small changes and keep doing it mm. to learn the skill that it takes to learn it. I mean, you, you learn skills, right? Skills are a learned thing. Um and also what I had to tell him is, honey, you, your, your ability to do something well or not do something well does not change how valuable you are, okay? Just because you can't do this doesn't mean that you can't do life. You know, it's who you are is not what you do. It kind of comes back to that truth, right? Um, and then he kind of half does the thing, like, mm, I'll barely try right now. I take a deep breath and I'm like, you can do it. You can. Here, try it this way. <laughs> try it this way. You can. And it's just a constant repetition in different ways of you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And, and little boys, especially, I'm, I'm finding need that constant affirmation that they 
can do something hard. And when he does, like, I had to give him space after that because when he finally did it and he changed the way he was stepping and throwing and it did the thing he wanted it to do, we have to just wait for proof. We have to just let him and wait for proof and not hover and just let them let them do the thing and then respond to the progress with joy and not I told you so like let them have the victory not don't take it from them yeah exactly because the I told you so like even like I told you you could do it see see it's a natural reaction that we have but watch your words because exactly what you said Sherry it's like make it about them make it about their accomplishment not the thing that you taught them to do because it's not about you it's about learning it's about them learning to handle and control and learn new things and persevere through the really really difficult situation and that is part one of the emotional journey of motherhood with guest jennifer bryant we hope that you will join us for part two you can find jen at practicalfamily.org and you can find me at sherryfletcher.com thank you